Funding for this program was provided by the Annenberg CPB Project. The first men and women were hunters and nomads, awed and frightened by a world they did not understand. They invested great energy in rituals, sacrifices, temples, tombs, and with religion came gods and god kings, magicians and priests, and the beginnings of a more complex society. The dawn of history this time on the Western tradition I'm Eugene Weber, and I teach history at UCLA, which is the University of California at Los Angeles. Today, I begin my personal journey through the history of Western civilization. I say personal because one man or one woman's view of history is not necessarily another's, as we shall see again and again during the next 52 programs. If you're wondering how we are going to cram several thousand years into 52 half hours, just remember that here in America we do everything very fast. For example, here is the history of the world in four minutes flat, just to get you in the mood. It's an excerpt from a film called Why Man Creates, by a creative man called Saul Bass. You just invented the wheels? I know, I know. Euclid arose and made order. What is the good life? And how do you lead it? Who shall rule the state? The philosopher king. The aristocrats. The people. You mean all the people? <gasps> what is the nature of the good? What is the nature of justice? What is happiness? Allah be praised. I've invented the zero. What? Nothing, nothing. What is the shape of the earth? Flat. What happens when you get to the edge? You fall off. Does the earth move? Never. 
The Earth moves. The Earth is round. The blood circulates. There are worlds smaller than ours. There are worlds larger than ours. Hey, what are you doing? I'm painting the ceiling. What are you doing? I'm painting the floor. Man is an animal. Rot. Man is not an animal. Animal. Man is. Is an animal. Mm -hmm. Shall we start from the beginning? I'm a bug. I'm a germ. I'm a bug. I'm a. Lui <gasps> pasteur. <gasps> I'm not a bug. I'm not a germ. I'm not a bug. I'm Alfred? Well, let's give it a try. What do you think? It worked. All men are created. Life, liberty, and the pursuit. Workers of the world. Government of the people. By the, the world people must be made safe for the war to end. A league of nations. I see one third of a nation ill housed. Ill -housed. One world. So now you know where we are headed, although I like to think it isn't as grim as all that. But where should we start? Perhaps the first thing to ask is what the scope of a series on the history of Western civilization should be. And the best way to think of it is that we are going back to the old country. We are going back to where many of our ancestors came from, to see where their stories came from, and their memories, and their habits, and the way they are, which has made us the way we are. This is what history is about, where we come from, what lies behind the way we live, and act, and think, how our institutions, our religions, our laws were made. And this is what I hope to do in this series, to go back to our origins. I know that all of us do not stem from the little peninsulas of Asia that we call Europe. But the language, the culture, the politics of the society we live in stem from there. And so it's an important journey for us to take from the very beginning. For our purposes, let's start about 60 million years ago, when the age of giant reptiles comes to an end. At that time, dinosaurs ruled. Mammals were cowering, timorous beasties that could never have challenged the superbly designed dinosaurs. And then, bang, a comet hits the Earth, the dinosaurs disappear, mammals get a chance to evolve, and among the mammals are the primates who tend to swing about in trees. Over five million years ago, one of these primate species, whose descendants made these footprints, one of these gets up on its hind legs. It doesn't make up its mind to go biped, but the less they hang about in trees, the more the primate's upper arms can be used to carry things. And the less they swing from trees, the longer their thumbs grow until they become opposable, which is convenient for grabbing and manipulating. And then, about two million years ago, these hands turn out a miracle an artifact, a tool, something they had fashioned themselves. And this is when we are no longer speaking of apes, 
but of something recognizably human in which a larger brain and manufactured stone tools go together. Like all primates, these beings close to human form that we call hominids did not have very good claws compared to a tiger, didn't have very good fangs compared to a wolf, but they found that if they wanted to grasp things, hands were superior to jaws. For example, with your hands, you can take a nut, you can put it on a stone, you can hit it with another stone, you can break it. Sometimes a stone would slip and chip the other stone, and God knows how many flints were chipped and flaked by mistake until one of these hominids actually saw what he had done and realized that he could do it again, and deliberately. From that day on, Primitive flint tools like these saved him from using his teeth for a lot of things. In the next two million years, he turned from vegetarian to carnivore, and the massive teeth made to chew on bark and grass and tubers, these teeth fined down. The powerful jaw muscles that imprisoned the skull relaxed. The brain that had been squeezed into the narrow skull began to expand. And this peculiar thinking animal was engaged on the road of thought and of dental decay. It was only around 7,000 BC that Stone Age people really learned to make fire by friction or by striking flints. Fire and thought together allowed hominids to expand into new habitats and ever more distant lands, even in times when glaciers like this one were pushing practically into the tropics and our ancestors had to think or die. So they thought. And they quickly realized that thinking did not prevent death. Here, for the first time in the history of life, a creature makes the imaginative leap that lets it conceive its own end by looking at the end of a creature like it. To imagine my death from the death of someone like me, to feel diminished, mystified, terrified by death and by the dead. And to deal with corpses and their mystery and the terror they generated, man develops rituals, myths, religions, into which he invests an immense amount of energy. So that for millennia, a significant portion of the little surplus of what people grew and made went into tombs and temples like Stonehenge here. I can talk about these ruins because about a hundred thousand years ago, something that we can loosely call language, something like language developed a new tool that allowed people to communicate meaningfully with one another. And then, in the new Stone Age, which is the age of Stonehenge, they also begin to devise primitive but revolutionary ways of storing information outside themselves by notches and markings and drawings, which means that now, Human beings could convey information, not by word of mouth alone, but by signs, as we do in writing. Above all, these first men and women were hunters, gleaners, and nomads moving across the steppes and forests in small clans, following the animals and plants off which they fed. 
Most of the cave paintings we have found are obviously the work of artists who were part of a hunting society. Then, somewhere around 10 to 12,000 years ago, some of these people settled down and we got an agricultural revolution, its origins as obscure as those of fire. When man discovered how to make the ground bear fruit, how to domesticate animals, how to store the product of his labors, he also developed a sense of property. And so structured societies grew up with villages, wells, walls, slaves, and families in which lots of children guaranteed labor and perpetuation. I say all this breezily, but you have to understand how long it all took. I told you that Stonehenge was built 3,800 years ago. Now, the first stone tools go back two and a half million years. The first stand-up creatures about our own size appear 1.6 million years ago. The first flaked flints appear 100,000 years after that. The first burials go back 70,000 years. And then at around 10,000 BC, we finally reach the Neolithic or New Stone Age, when our journey really begins. Neolithic societies and families depended on fertility and security. But both of these were very precarious indeed. Stone Age agriculture goes with warfare. It goes with endless raids and counter raids for the neighbor's crops for the neighbor's pigs. And so these people were never free from fear, fear of thieves, of raiders, of evil spirits, of nature, you name it. And the rituals to protect them from danger, to secure good hunting, good crops, success in battle, these rituals were crucial. And so these people developed increasingly complex magic techniques most of which involve human sacrifices. They establish their property and their welfare on heaps of human corpses. Very few religions have ever done without sacrifices. And human sacrifice, with its terrifying emotional impact, enhances the power of religion to shape our imagination. In due course, more sophisticated religions were going to substitute animals for humans. But this kind of cut-rate salvation would have seemed quite useless in the late Stone Age. The paradox is that all these sacrifices were intended to help the forces of life, as symbolized by this Earth Goddess. Stone Age peasants worship the forces of nature, ever burgeoning, ever dying, ever renewed. And in this preoccupation with fertility, we find the origins of religion, kingship, political institutions, and basic social patterns. We don't know how this worked. But it may be that once humans had figured out the relationship between sexual intercourse and childbearing, they created rituals based on the sexual act, rituals which they hoped would bring about the fertility of nature. In many prehistoric rituals, a male impersonated the seed and so assumed the role of leader, he became what the ancient Britons called the Grain King. At first, he was killed and buried, planted really, and replaced by a young and vigorous successor. And the people who acted this out, in whom the forces of nature were thought to be incarnated, 
these people were seen as gods and goddesses or as something very close to gods and goddesses. But eventually, society was persuaded that the grain king's death could be made just as magically effective by going through the motions, by symbolism. And when that happened, then the grain king was on his way to becoming a real king as well. And this transition would be facilitated if he was also the war chief of the clan. We're not sure if this is the way it really happened, but we do know that real kings in Egypt and Mesopotamia did perform many of the functions in fertility rituals that I attributed to the grain king. In the earliest societies, it's possible to speculate that women might be worshipped as the creators of life. But while the reproductive power of woman is recognized in mythologies and rituals, the position of women in agricultural societies was far less free and equal than it was in hunting societies. And this was probably accentuated by a new tool that made it easier to grow crops, the ox-drawn plow. Because it required considerable strength, the plow was generally used by men. Women were left to do almost everything else with most of the drudgery and practically no status because men spent most of their time raiding or looking out for raiders. Agriculture and husbandry, religion and war would henceforth be the enduring benchmarks of human experience, the former to produce a subsistence and a small surplus, the latter to confiscate and consume them. Again, the details are rather vague. But we do know that early societies which left records were patriarchal and so were their religions. And we know that these religions had priests. If magic was essential to make crops grow and cattle prosper, if fertility and healing and preservation from danger were thought to benefit the whole community, then the community would contribute to the upkeep of these specialists. And with these magicians and priests, we get the first economic class not directly engaged in producing its own food. In time, other such classes would appear, potters, miners, and craftsmen who work copper or other metals. All of this implies two things. One, that the economy was capable of producing a surplus. Two, that things were getting more complicated, that not everybody was self-sufficient anymore, which in turn led to trade with further specialization, further surpluses, markets where surpluses were exchanged, and eventually bigger settlements not directly connected with agriculture, which we call cities and towns. And then this economic differentiation would produce a social differentiation. Society would then divide into the rich, nobles and free men, and the poor, dependents and slaves, with the rich having most of the land becoming lords over the others. These lords fought among themselves because being human they wanted to dominate or to despoil one another. Then, as now, greed and revenge seem to dominate what you might loosely call political activity. And so men joined under the authority of the strongest or were forced to join 
and the landowning system developed, which lasted thousands of years and which looks very much like the feudal system of the Middle Ages, where one man holds his land from another and owes him payment and service in return. This sort of evolution was general. We find it in India, in China, in the Near East, and also at a later time, but in similar circumstances, in Europe. But it would be most early and most marked in areas where people were thickest on the ground, where the struggle for land was most intense, where organization for production, for defense, was most important. And these conditions were to be found in the area that we know today as the Fertile Crescent, that small portion of Asia and Africa that runs from Mesopotamia and Syria in the east to Egypt in the west. As we shall see in our next program, the ancient Egyptians. Until then, I'm Eugene Weber for the Western tradition. for this program was provided by the Annenberg CPB project. For information about the Western Tradition television course, transcripts, pre-recorded video cassettes, off-air taping, or related books based on the television series, viewers should call the Annenberg CPB projects, 1-800-Learner telephone number, or write to the Annenberg CPB project, 1111 16th Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036. This is PBS.